So I think I might be psychic. I am psychic. Everybody's, everyone's psychic. But I was always psychic as a kid. You know, I always saw deaths before they happened. And, um, and my mom was a little kind of psychic, so she identified that in me and, um, um, you know, dealt with all my, I used to see spirits all the time in my house, so it was very scary. Our first house on Lawrence Place was haunted. It's so weird, this last time when I was in the hospital, I had this dream that somehow I went down this elevator chute and I was down in the basement of the hospital. And I, down in the basement with piles of coals and a furnace. And I kept telling them, I don't belong here. I belong, where's the elevator to take me back up? Can't you see that I don't belong down here? And I kept asking everyone directions, you know, how do I get out of this cave? And they would point in that direction and I'd look in that direction and I kept walking and I couldn't get any place. And I woke up in the hospital screaming and the nurse came over and said, what's going on? I was like, oh, I had a nightmare. <laughs> Well, I'm a free spirit, you know, I really am. I don't conform to anyone else's rules, <laughs> but my own. And, you know, I like to dance. I like to, uh, I'm a dancer, really, I am a natural dancer. Um, I'm a writer. I like writing flash fiction and screenplays. I just like writing anything. I probably can write in any genre. Um, but I like telling stories. That was my major. I collect rock and roll memorabilia. I like that. I have a, quite a, a, a nice poster collection, I think. <laughs> um, I'm also a Beatle maniac. And I had been a Beatle maniac all my life. <laughs> so I'm sort of an expert on the Beatles. I've read just about everything there is to know about them. So I'm sort of bored with there isn't any new information about the Beatles. That's the sad thing. There's nothing new I can learn about them. So, but that's those are my hobbies. I also an ex-marathoner, used to run. I am a survivor, definitely a survivor. I can't tell you how many times I've had cancer, maybe five times, <laughs> and I survived. Um, oh yeah, grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. You know I have to be a survivor in order to grow up in Patterson, New Jersey. That was a rough town. Even in the, in the 60s and the 50s when I were there, I was living there. It was a rough environment to be in. So anyway, that's who I am. <laughs> what do you think? Besides being a mother of raising three boys? Are you kidding me? I was a single mother. So... I raised three successful boys, kept them out of trouble. I was a tough mom. You can tell me, tell them that. You can testify to that, Alex. <laughs>
Anyway, the story is, this, this, the, the, the moral of the story is that, um, like, that was, a, that, was a, that was a difficult situation. I think that was probably st was stressful for you. And she did everything she could do to give me the creature comfort to feel like everything was okay. And that's the kind of thing that a mom does. And that's, like, that's something that I, um, that I draw upon a lot. I've been thrust into some, every single thing that I do when I ever try to change and get better is like incredibly challenging. Going to India was a situation like that where it was like, oh, he's either going to knock it out of the park and make it happen or he's going to fail. And if he fails, fuck him, who cares, right? Fuck that guy. He's just a piece of shit. Like he's, he's worth nothing. And so situations like that, um, even now I'm getting ready to, to have a, a huge challenge put in front of me, but, um, like when your last New Year's, when your stomach, you're having, you're having trouble with that. And I was sitting right there, you know, I was, I was dealing with vice presidents at my company and I was taking care of you and I was hair falling out of my head. And I was like, well, what are you made of? <laughs> you know? So. And we're screaming at each other. Yeah. And then, we, and then we were screaming at each other. Yeah. At a certain point in time, it was like middle of the night. And I was like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Let's have control. <laughs> I was like, what do you want me to do? Um, so yeah. No, you're stubborn. You're That's a Capricorn. A, yeah, we're Capricorn. both. Yeah, but you're a, you're a stubborn I'm a Cancerian. Little wild man, you I mean, can't. Oh my too. god, you're a stubborn Cancerian. But yeah, those that that even story that that story even just with you two in the room is hard for me to tell without like choking up a little bit. Well, supposedly we're at supposedly complete opposites. <laughs> That's why we're good for one another. Okay. Because we Capricorns are the. Uh, opposite of Cancerian, so that's why I have so many Capricorns in my life, okay. which is practically everyone, my entire family. So we get along, kiddo. Oh boy, you, you one of three. Yep. I remember that instant, that part where we were living in that place down in that little apartment. Well, I, while I was living in that little apartment. I was coming in, but Drew and I were coming in, and the guy snatched my purse as I was coming in the house. <laughs> oh, you guys saw me. He snatched my purse and ran up the as I was getting out of the car or going inside. But Drew and I, and he ran up the alley, and but Drew, without thinking, went charging up the alley after the guy. And when he got to the guy, the guy pulled the gun on him. <laughs> it's like, okay, man, you can keep the purse. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, surgery. <laughs> what can I say? I'm worried. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Not only do I have cataracts, but I have glaucoma as well. <laughs> I have macular degeneration. I have cataracts and I have glaucoma. <laughs> so anyway, the windows of the world, they need help. And Coke bottle glasses were always unattractive. <laughs> So people always, kids always made fun of my eyeglasses when I was growing up. Okay. All right, take care now. Thank you. Thanks yeah. Wasn't scary at all. You know what's so weird is I thought I was having surgery on my left eye. She told me it was my left eye, okay? Because we had a whole discussion. I was like, oh, too bad. That's my strong eye. And she was like, well... It's the one that has the most deposit. So I get in there and they're telling me, we have you operating on your right eye. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, she said, it's my left eye. And then the lady's going to prep me and she says, well, I got to wait now that you're saying it's your, it's supposed to be your left eye. So they had to wait until the doctor came and the doctor wasn't sure. She said, let me go over my notes. And then she says, yes, it is your left, your right eye. You're having surgery on your right eye. You're not having surgery on your left eye. Then she made a mistake. I don't know, but she doesn't remember that she and I had a whole conversation about her operating on my strong eye.
And she said, no, remember, we decided to operate on your left eye because that's your weakest eye and we felt we could <laughs> repair the vision. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I still don't know. The medical community thinks that I'm fragile. <laughs> I don't feel fragile. I just feel like it's just another hurdle. I'm constantly going over hurdles um, and I'm, I'm doing it. You know, and I know as I get older, there's going to be more hurdles to go through. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking them very well. I'm getting through them, you know. Um, I'm not emotional around that. It's like it's a, I, I accept it as a part of life that this is going to be, this is a part of living. If you want to continue to live, you have to keep doing this. My first surgery was when I was 14 years old, a sleigh riding accident. I ruptured my kidney and my spleen, and I lost my spleen in that surgery, and I almost died. I was on the critical list, and I had lost a lot of blood, and I got very sick. So I was in intensive care for a solid week. Rosie was telling me there was a sign on, my, on the end of my hospital bed that was leaning towards death. And there were no, you were not supposed to talk to me. And during surgery, I, I flatlined. And I remember leaving my body and being on top. I, I, I remember everything that happened and what was said in the uh, OR. And I told my doctor and he said, yes, he said all those things. And I was supposed to be conscious. But I left my body and I was looking at observing the surgery and everything they said. So, you know, I had actually died <laughs> practically on the table, but I had been unconscious that whole time, you know, I had been unconscious. <laughs> it was nice getting away. It was nice coming here to heal from being, you know, homeless and um, for that short period of time. Um, I think I was homeless for six months or so, maybe. Um, um, it was a good place to land after, um, um, you know, after going through all of that in Fairfax. I, I left Fairfax um, during a vulnerable time. I had just had uh, my... Uh, real serious bout with cancer uh, because it had gotten out all my other cancers had never gotten past stage two or outside of the um, area outside of the colon but this last time when i got my when i lost my colon it was stage three it had gotten right outside of the um the colon and i had to have chemotherapy and while i was going through chemotherapy is when I remember we had a problem with issue with the plumbing. There was a leak in our garage. They gave us the, that, the excuse that they needed the apartment. We needed to move because they had to renovate and tear all of that down out and repair it. And when the real reason was they just wanted us to move so that they can raise the rent. And so we were presented with a notice that we had to be out in 30 days, which was like, I was going through chemo at the time and and it was like, oh my God. So I was homeless. I had, we had to move, I couldn't find a place. I was in the middle of a crisis. You know, I was homeless for a minute. I had to live in a, a, a shelter for a month. And that was very rough, living in a shelter with a bunch of people and an, and an ileostomy meaning I had to get up many times at night and empty my uh, bag, which was kind of disturbing all the other tenants. And then I got called about um, uh, these places. They all both came up at one time. I had a choice of going into Hamilton or coming out here, and I chose um, Point Ray Station. So it's been a challenge living in Marin, being black in Marin, because... You know, it's not a whole lot of black folks living in Marin unless you go down to Marin City. And I've had to deal with a lot of discrimination here. Um, in Fairfax, 
I remember the year that, well, the year that I had the, the surgery and my doctors had told me they wanted me to exercise. I had to walk the neighborhood and I would walk the hills of uh, Fairfax. And I remember walking one day and this man came up to me and said, do you live here? And I was like, yeah, I live here. He says, well, where do you live? And I, I thought I couldn't understand why he was saying that but I said yeah I've been living here I live on on Willow uh he says I says I've been there for 10 years he says well I've been here for 25 years and then he just drove off so I was like it was kind of his way of saying get out of the neighborhood to me um you hear so much about us Marin being racist but it's very cool out here people you know, because there isn't this this divide between the haves and the half-nots here. People here are cool in Port Louis Station. I can say that. That I, I don't feel like I'm getting discriminated against here at all. I don't pick up on that energy. And if I do pick up on that energy, it's from outsiders coming here on the weekend, tourists that come here and they see a black person and, you know, they're not used to being around. Uh, and they have this weirdness, <laughs> you know, because people come here to from all over the world. So, you know, and you kind of, during the weekend, people from Point Reyes who live here are, they kind of stay in and let the tourists take over the town. And then when they leave on Monday, we have control of our town again. You know, that's how it is out here. That's how locals rule. That's why I moved out here. You know, I've had dreams about death, that I was in the hospital ward or that I was someplace. Well, my dreams have always been being in a hospital ward and death is a, a woman with um, she looks like a bride, only everything is pseudo black. She's wearing a black veil. She's wearing a black dress. And I'm look, trying to chase underneath her to, look to, to lift up her veil. And then, you know, she turns around and I'm like running in the other direction. So um, I've had that dream a couple of times. And then the last dream I had of death was uh, same lady. <laughs> I spotted her across the street somewhere. And when I spotted her, I tried to run in the other direction. And then I looked around and she was standing right behind me. Look at this beautiful day and this beautiful view. And just being blessed every day that I'm here and I'm still alive, you know? And I still got places to go and people to see. And I still have stories to write. And I'm gonna be writing them. 